Paul is devoting this time to uh, deal with uh, the future of Israel and the future restoration of Israel that we'll look at uh, next time. Uh, Paul is uh, certainly uh, concerned at what would become of the, of the Jewish people as they allow Gentiles into the church and uh, in, in terms of the future. Last week we looked at the believing remnant in the first 10 verses. Uh, Paul certainly points out that he himself is part of that remnant. He gave Elijah as an example, Elijah running from uh, Ahab and Jezebel, and uh, basically saying, I'm the only one that hasn't bowed my knee. Uh, and the Lord answers, no, I've got 7,000 others, a remnant, a remnant much larger than you can imagine. So uh, Paul is the, the pattern of the example of this uh, uh, remnant. Uh, they are much larger than you can imagine. Uh, and then he says it was also predicted, the, uh, the rejection of uh, the Messiah by Israel, and he quotes Isaiah and David to, uh, to prove that. Uh, now he's going to deal with the idea of there is a rejection. He stated that. It was prophetic. We knew that it would happen, but it's temporary. Uh, it's not going to last forever. And then next week in verse 25 to 32, we'll deal with the restoration. We've said that it's important to study this because otherwise we'll fail to evangelize the Jewish people, of whom the gospel is supposed to go first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Paul told us that very early on in the book of Romans. We may fall into anti-Semitism, which uh, so much of the church has, and, uh, and actually were the thrust behind uh, so much of the persecution of the Jewish people through the centuries. We talked about that a bit last week. Uh, we'll mention a few other examples and how theology plays a role in that. And we may fail to trust the promises of God. If God can't keep the promises made to Israel, why would he keep the promises he's making to us? And uh, so it's important for us to know that God will keep all of his promises uh, made to, uh, to Israel. But there is a temporary rejection. And let's look at the results of that uh, first. The results of the nation rejecting the Messiah. Verse 11. Paul says, I say then, have they stumbled uh, that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches for the world, and their failures riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? So there's two results here. Uh, certainly, uh, one of them we should be thankful for, and the other one we should be a participant of. The results, including the gospel coming to uh, the Gentiles. Now, notice the language he uses in verse 11, the nation stumbled. Verse 12, he uses the term their fall and their failure. Verse 15, and they were cast away. But none of those terms ever suggest any kind of a final judgment. Again, as those that hold to replacement theology would say uh, today. Uh, God has promised the Gentiles uh, would be saved. Uh, he keeps his promises, but he'll keep his promise to the nation of Israel as well. It's important to understand that the Old Testament promises that the Gentiles would all be, always be linked into uh, the kingdom that would come from Israel. Uh, we're linked together. Prophecies like uh, uh, Isaiah 11, verse 11 says, there the prophet writing, it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria and Egypt, from Pathros to Cush, from Elam to Shinar, from Hamath to the Isles of the Sea, maybe the Hawaiian Isles. He will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcast of Israel and gather together dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. And we could go on and on with passages about God's faithfulness to Israel. Even though they've been dispersed, he's going to gather them back. He's gathered them back into the land now in unbelief, but obviously there's a prediction, a prophecy, many that they're going to be gathered back together uh, in faith and in belief. Isaiah, uh, later in chapter 60, talks about the Gentiles sharing in that future kingdom, where he says in verse 1 of chapter 60, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, Israel, and his glory will be seen upon you, the Gentiles shall come to your light and the kings of the brightness to your rising. Again, uh, Israel uh, did not rise, but she fell. Uh, but it's a temporary falling. Uh, and uh, because of that, God introduces a new factor into the equation. 
that Paul refers to in Ephesians as a mystery. And the mystery is something that was not known that's now been revealed is the fact that we'd have this thing called the church that would have Jews and Gentiles together. Keep in mind, in context here, what Paul's talking about is groups of people, not individuals. He's not talking about individual Jews. He's not talking about individual Gentiles. He's talking about Israel as a nation, as a group of people, uh, and Gentiles in general as a group of people. And one of the results of the gospel being rejected temporarily is that the gospel has now gone out uh, to the rest of the world. We're about ready to celebrate uh, Fourth of July, the birth of our nation. Uh, we're able to do that because Israel rejected the gospel, because our founding fathers, who were Christians, were sent. They got saved, and they came to, uh, to what we call America to share the gospel, found a nation with religious freedoms. The reason that uh, we can rejoice today here in the islands is because some young men and some women read the memoirs of Henry Opakahia, and because of that, they went out and brought the gospel here in open arms, waiting for it because Israel rejected. Adoram Judson went, went to Burma. Hudson Taylor went to China because Israel had rejected the gospel. So when we say that the gospel went to the Gentiles, we're talking about around the world. And certainly there's a lot more work to be done. But God has instituted a new program called the church as a result of this rejection of the Messiah. But uh, it's a temporary rejection. The second result that we should be participants is, is that uh, they would be provoked to jealousy. Paul stated that the Gentiles have this vital ministry, uh, that they would actually uh, uh, see our relationship with God, which is personal, which is vibrant, uh, which is alive, uh, which is real, uh, something that they do not have. They don't have today. They didn't have then. And they would be provoked to jealousy to want to have the same thing. Unfortunately, all we've done for the most part is just provoke them. <laughs> but it hasn't been to provoke them to jealousy that they would want to come to faith uh, in, uh, in their Messiah. Israel today, again, in a sense, is spiritually bankrupt. There is no temple. There is no priest. There are no sacrifices. They can gather in synagogues and worship, and they have the scriptures and so forth, and they can study them. But there is not a personal relationship. There is not a forgiveness of sins. There's not a sense that they're going to uh, be with the Lord. It's all about good deeds outweighing bad deeds, and we don't know, but maybe, and we hope so, and which of these promises apply and which of them don't, and how will we interpret the scriptures. Uh, and it's the same with so many others that you share with. All those people that knock on your doors, whether they're Jehovah's Witness or Mormons or anybody else, they have a religion, but they don't know the Lord. They don't have what you have. They, don't, they can't cry out in desperation in, in difficult times and know that God is there and that he cares and that he loves them. They don't know that their sins have been forgiven and cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. They don't have any of that. And sometimes they say, I don't know what to say to those people. Tell them your testimony. Tell them the difference that God's made in your life. That is supposed to and should, not just the Jews, but other people as well, I think, provoke them to, well, jealousy. Jealousy, I wish I had that. Uh, maybe that's something we haven't done a good job of. But both of these things are the results of the nation rejecting the Messiah. It includes the gospel going to the world, to the Gentiles, and hopefully being provoked to jealousy. Paul has a little more to say about that. Verse 13 to 16 he mentions the idea of rejoicing in Israel's acceptance. Paul again dresses, we would say, the Gentiles for the first time in this very rabbinical sounding, very Jewish letter, Romans. For the first time, he turns to the, uh, to the Gentiles in verse 13 and says, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy... Those who are my flesh and save some of them. For if their being cast away as the reconciling of the world, what would their acceptance be but life from the dead? For if the first fruits is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. So part of the rejoicing or joy, joy of Paul's ministry is that he could have an impact uh, on his own brethren. Paul's out trying to preach the gospel and very effectively, of course, and, uh, and reach the Gentiles. And we read the book of Acts and we see his, his MO there is always to the Jew first 
uh, into the synagogues, into the places where the Jews would gather if there was no synagogue, preaching the gospel, proving from the scriptures, which he was able to do, that Jesus was the Messiah. Some would accept, some wouldn't. Whoever came with him, he would continue the ministry to the Gentiles, hoping that as those Jews in that town, in that city, in that village, wherever it might be, would see what's happening. That these Gentiles have come to know the one true God of Israel. They have a relationship with him. And God is doing a tremendous work by his spirit in their hearts. They would be provoked and say, and to jealous and go, I want that as well. And I think that probably happened often uh, in Paul's ministry. But it was something that was uh, meant to continue. And he felt that then the more Gentiles he could reach with the gospel, the more provoking to jealousy there would be, and the more Jews he could actually reach. And you can imagine and understand why in opening of chapter 9, he says in hyperbole, of course, uh, that if I could, he can't, of course, but if I could, I would trade my salvation. I would go to hell myself if it would mean the salvation of the Jewish people. That's a lot of passion. But who was he called to? The Gentiles. Uh, God's, God's got a sense of humor, doesn't he? He takes this rabbi who's uh, elevated among his peers uh, who has the privilege of studying at one of the great rabbis of all times, Gamaliel, uh, who, as far as we can tell, is probably a member of the Sanhedrin because he's there holding the coats when Stephen is, uh, is martyred, giving his official approval of all of that. He has that in everything, this tremendous education. Who does God send him to? Uh, he sends him actually to the Gentiles. And we find that in the book of Acts when he's converted on the Damascus road. God tells him then. He mentions this in a couple of places in the letter to the church at Galatia. In chapter 2, verse 2, he says, I went up, going up to Jerusalem, by revelation and communicated to them that the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. So he's going to the Gentiles. That's his ministry. Later in verse 6, he says, But from those who seemed to be something, whatever they were, makes no difference to me, God shows uh, personal favoritism to no man. Uh, for those who seemed to be something added nothing to me. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised, the Gentiles, had been committed to me as the gospel for the circumcised, the Jews, was to Peter. For he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me towards the Gentiles. And when James... Cephas, or Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceive the grace that had been given to me. They gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles that they to, that, uh, and they to the circumcised. Motivated in his ministry, a joy in his heart. As he's reaching the Gentiles with the gospel, he knew in, a, in fact it would have an impact on the Jewish people living in that community. It was part of his motivation. Secondly, he says they'll be rejoicing in the future, even though Israel has been temporarily cast away. Uh, and again, he says, if you think what has happened, because they rejected the gospel, the gospel's gone to the world, to the Gentiles. And he goes, if you think that's fantastic, think about what their acceptance will be in the future. It's like a dead person that's come to life again. In a sense, that's his first illustration, uh, and, uh, and it will be uh, glorious. Zechariah says of that time in chapter 12, verse 10, And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they have pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Later in chapter 13, of verse 1, Zechariah continues, in that day a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uh, uncleanness. That hasn't happened yet, has it? No, that's still yet future. Paul says there's still a future that God's going to deal with Israel. And he goes, when it happens, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be tremendous rejoicing. What will it be like? It's like somebody that's dead, dead for a long time couple thousand years <laughs> and now they're going to come back to life it's going to be uh, incredible again today spiritual uh, Israel has fought they have fallen spiritually but when Christ returns the nation will rise again then Paul supports this by giving uh, two illustrations 
The one is simply dough or bread, and the other one is the idea of a root of a tree. And he basically says, if the first fruits, the first portion of the dough, of the bread, if the essential ingredients are good, then the whole loaf is going to be good. In our house, we don't bake a lot of bread, but we make cookies. So we might say, if the first portion of the dough, the chocolate chip dough, uh, and you bake that part, you don't have to bake it all at once. Did you know that? You can put part away. So you can always have fresh cookies. This is just a little tip. Uh, if you take that out, and you take that first portion, of course, if you're like Peter and Melissa, they just eat the dough if they're in a hurry. But if you take the first portion and you make the cookies and they're good, the assumption is you bake the rest of it. It's going to be good as well. Uh, that's his first illustration. And it's really tied into Numbers 15, 17, in this idea of offering. If God accepts the first part and says it's holy, then God's going to accept the other part uh, as well. Uh, he's applying that to the history of, uh, of Israel. Uh, the second idea is that of an olive tree. And he's going to continue the illustration in the next portion of Scripture. But again, the root. Uh, he's talking about uh, Israel. Uh, Jeremiah uh, says that uh, in symbolism, Israel can be pictured as the olive tree. Hosea puts it this way in chapter 14, verse 4. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned away from him. And I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall grow like the lily and lengthen his roots like Lebanon. His branches shall spread. His beauty shall be like an olive tree and his fragrance like Lebanon. So in terms of the, the bigger picture of the nation of Israel, they are like an olive tree. And he mentions the roots here. What is the root? Well, the root is, well, it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, it's, it's the patriarchs. It's the fathers. Why? Because to them was given the covenants, the Abrahamic covenant, which is uh, unconditional. Uh, and it does not end. And, uh, and it's still in effect today. How do we know that? Well, look at verse 17. He says it right there. This is my covenant. In verse 28, he says, it's for the Father's sake. It's not the Father in heaven, singular. Uh, it's plural. Uh, it's for the Father's, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They are the root. And if the root is good, predicated on the promises of God and the Abrahamic covenant, which is unconditional, if the root is good, he says, then eventually the tree is going to be good uh, as well. So the lump and the branches are the nation of Israel. The roots of the tree support the tree, and that is the patriarchs who founded the nation. The results of the nation rejecting the Messiah temporarily have done two things. They brought the gospel to the Gentiles literally around the world as that continues today. The hope is it would provoke other Jews, and maybe again we haven't uh, done a good job at this, we've done more provoking and not enough provoking to jealousy so that they would want what we want, and certainly we want to do that for anybody around us, uh, but certainly it's meant to have an impact on them because we are worshiping their God. Keep in mind that little rabbinical saying I mentioned a few weeks ago that says, how odd of God to choose the Jew." But not so odd as those who choose the Jewish God and hate the Jew. It wasn't a Gentile that made that up, by the way. Uh, it's been a problem. Uh, it's not, it hasn't gone down the way it's supposed to. And we'll see more of that as we look at Paul's warnings to us guys, us Gentiles, later. Uh, they'll, they'll will be rejoicing in Israel's acceptance, uh, which is still future. They're casting away. It's just been temporary. Well, now we really turn our sights on ourselves in verse 17 to 24, where I've just titled this simply, Gentiles should remember their Jewish roots. Verse 17, and if some of the branches were broken off and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell. 
severity, but towards you goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you will also be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, who are natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Several things here. And the first one that we should remember is that we're the wild olive branches. <laughs> we're not the natural ones. Uh, we're, the, we're, uh, we're the wild ones. And, and to understand the illustration, and I don't know anything about grafting or, at all. I was uh, one of the gals in the first service was telling me her grandfather was into this. Uh, in her yard, they had an apple tree that grew six kinds of apples. Because everywhere they travel, he'd find another kind of an apple tree, just get a little twig about that big, and very carefully graft it in. And they had all these different apples. So you can take something that produces fruit, the natural olive branch. Uh, and you can take that and you can take a wild olive tree that produces nothing. It just looks like an olive tree. It produces nothing. It's wild. You can take the one that produces and graft it in and it will continue to produce fruit. What you can't do is take the wild olive tree, that's us, and, 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 and take a, a stem or a branch off that and graft it into the natural one, it still will never produce olives. It just won't do it. So Paul's illustration, please understand, is that we're the wild, we've been grafted in. How did that happen? Supernaturally. Supernaturally. He says this is contrary to nature. It doesn't really happen this way normally. This is just a miracle by God. How did we all get saved? It was a miracle. <laughs> it was a supernatural act of God. He mentioned, uh, again, we saw last week, the only way people get saved is because of God's election and God's choosing, which he says is totally by grace. It's totally by God's grace. It's a supernatural act that he, he performs. Uh, it's not supposed to happen. Uh, but here's the picture of us. We need to remember that we're the wild olive branches. The only way we got saved and got into this thing is, uh, is the, a supernatural act of God to be born again by God's spirit. Secondly, Gentiles should remember that Israel, like the natural branch of an olive tree, has been broken off. Israel was broken off that we might be grafted in. They were broken off, he says, because of unbelief. We were grafted in and we stand now by, by faith. Look at verse 19 again. You will say then branches were broken off uh, that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief they were broken off. And you stand by faith do not be haughty, but fear. In other words, don't be prideful. Instead, be fearful. Uh, he said, he, we'll talk about this more towards the end. Uh, things to remember. But if God judged them and broke them off, uh, don't think he could do that again. Uh, so he says, don't, don't be prideful. Don't be haughty about this whole thing. Gentiles have an obligation to Israel. And certainly, it's, uh, again, it's a Jewish Messiah that saved us based on the Jewish scriptures and prophecies that came, it's all because of the root that we are grafted into, the Abrahamic covenant, the patriarchs. That's how we end up getting saved. Uh, the only reason the gospel came to us anyway is because of their rejection uh, and those branches that were broken off. It would have never happened without that and without a supernatural work of God. And we should be haughty or proud because we've accomplished something. We have something that they don't have currently. Paul says, no, you should be fearful. You should have a reverence towards God. Third, he says, Gentiles should remember God's goodness and severity. Verse 22, therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell severity. But towards you, goodness. It's Israel that has suffered the severity of God. Uh, it's on the Gentiles that we've, uh, again, accepted his goodness. Again, keep in mind, we're not talking about individuals. It has nothing to do with an individual somehow being cut off, losing his, losing his relationship with the Lord or his faith or anything. It's talking about the bigger picture of what God is doing uh, through two different groups of people. Fourth, Gentiles should remember that Israel will be grafted in again. Again, following the illustration, uh, if, uh, you know, if we're the wild and, and we get grafted in and we're not supposed to produce fruit, it's not supposed to happen. It's a supernatural thing, and yet God causes it to happen. He goes, think about how much easier it will be 
if all of us could get saved, think of how much easier it will be for God to save Jewish people. They're the natural. They're supposed to be there. They're supposed to belong. It's their scripture. It's their covenants. It's their Messiah. They're the root. We get grafted in. We shouldn't be proud about that. We should be thankful about that, even a little fearful about that in terms of our reverence for God and what he's done for us in this supernatural act. How much easier it will be, Paul says, uh, for the Jews to be grafted in uh, again as well. Uh, but again, it's worth noting that according to Bible prophecy, this Gentile church, this thing that's happening right now, again, we say Gentile church, but it's made of Jews as well. It's just become predominantly Gentile over the centuries. Uh, he's saying that uh, be careful because that can be cut off as well. Uh, that focus or that shift of the work of the Holy Spirit in terms of salvation could radically change. Well, in fact, it is going to change, isn't it, in the future? In fact, is there is going to be a great falling away. We pray for a great revival here, don't we, in our state, and we should be praying, in our country, especially given the uh, Supreme Court uh, decisions this last week. Uh, they're not game changers. That's not what the other side wanted. It's bad, but it's not as bad as it could have been, if you understand their, their rulings and so forth. But it just causes us that, man, we need to be praying for our state, praying for our country. Uh, we're not promised a big revival in the end. That's what we pray for. What we are promised in the future is a great falling away, a great falling away. That's why we think it's important to focus on the word of God. We think people need to come in and be ministered through the teaching of the word of God. I'm not sure it's a great time that we should be focused on performing and entertaining people on Sunday mornings because there's a great falling away uh, that is predicted in the future. Look what Paul said to 1 Timothy. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Later in writing to Timothy the second time, in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, uh, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but deny, denying its power, uh, and from such people turn away. Does that sound like the evening news or what? Uh, th th this, that's pretty contemporary right, right there. Uh, two Thessalonians, again, Paul writing to chapter 2, verse 1, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, in our gathering to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, uh, as though the day of Christ has come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. We refer to him as the Antichrist, a great falling away in the future. Things are going to change in the future. Paul is saying Israel is going to be grafted in and God is able to graft them in. You need to be careful, he says, you Gentiles, and remember some things that are very important because it's the root that supports the olive tree, not the other way around. And God will keep his promises. God will keep his promises to the patriarchs. Therefore, he'll keep our promises to us. Uh, we can rely. When Jesus says, I'll never leave you, I'll, no, I'll never forsake you. When he says, I go and prepare a place for you, we can, we can count on all those promises. Uh, again, all the things promised to Israel has not happened yet, but Paul says they will, uh, they are yet future. God is still the God of Abraham, Isaac, uh, and Jacob. He'll keep the promises to them. Now, again, just to go over these warnings, how has the Gentiles done in regards to the warnings? And there's really two. I've mentioned one already, the idea of pride. That's in verse 18. Do not boast against the branches, but if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. Well, have we become prideful? Well, I think it's become a lot worse than that. Again, 85% uh, of the church, we call the whole church from, from Russia and Greek Orthodox to Anglican to uh, Church of England to Lutheran and all the Reformed guys. If we count all of that, 85% of the church absolutely rejects what I just said to you. It rejects what Paul says here. It says that the church has now supernaturally replaced Israel. 
and all the promises to Israel, although he's talking about a literal people and a literal nation, he says he's not. It's an allegory, and it's now all given over to the church. Uh, it's interesting, in the late 80s, early 90s, this kind of spread for the first time into Pentecostalism because of the whole health and wealth, name and acclaim it kind of theology. After all, this is the ultimate name and acclaim it right here, that all the promises to Israel are now for me. Uh, and, it, uh, and once that was taught in a few places by those that have adopted that doctrine, uh, it spread there as well. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a terrible thing. Paul's warning is that don't become prideful. Man, don't become prideful. Uh, it's become a lot worse than that. We've actually, the church has actually taken this passage of scripture and this section of Romans to justify the persecution uh, of the Jewish people. And that goes all the way from the Crusades to all the pogroms to uh, the Spanish Inquisition all the way to the Holocaust. Adolf Hitler himself quoted this passage of scripture to say that they are the branches that have been broken off and God will use me as the severity to bring it upon them as he preached to the churches who joined him in that mission and stood aside. I get a little excited about this. I get a little concerned. I was hoping that people didn't leave last week thinking I was mad at them, but I, I just kind of, I, I, I've been to Yad Vashem a couple of times uh, in Jerusalem and then a, a year ago, Kathy and I were uh, in Washington, D.C., seeing all the monuments and, uh, and everything in museums, which is just an awesome experience. And, and we kind of debated whether we'd go to the, to the Holocaust uh, uh, Museum or not, and, uh, and then decided that uh, uh, we should go. It's, 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 not, uh, it's one of those, uh, it's not like it's going to just uh, cheer you up and make your day kind of thing, but it, we just felt like we, we needed to go. And, <clears throat> so we went down, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's beautifully done, and it's very, very moving. And I appreciated the fact that, uh, uh, that uh, they did uh, give the picture that there was some resistance uh, by some evangelical Christians uh, in Germany. Uh, men, uh, uh, that uh, names you're familiar with, Nemo Moller, he, his typewriter was there that he typed his sermons on uh, in terms of standing for the Jewish people and what uh, Christians should be doing at that time. Uh, and you've got uh, Bonhoeffer and some of his things there as well. Uh, and, uh, but it goes on, and of course you go through and see uh, uh, basically from uh, Dachau and some of the other uh, places uh, where the death camps were, they actually took uh, their, uh, their bunk beds and the things where they lived and actually rebuilt them in the museum. So it's, uh, it's not something kind of like, no, that, that's it uh, right there. And uh, it's... Uh, Incredibly, uh, incredibly done. I was talking to uh, uh, one of our, one of the young Marine couples that was here with us for a number of years, and they're they're back on the uh, the East Coast, and and uh, we spent some spent some time with them, and he's saying that uh, he got to see it when Steven Spielberg came and they first opened it, uh, and they selected a few uh, midshipmen from the academy uh, to uh, go down and be able to uh, to to see it, and he was one of those guys that uh, <laughs> got selected. Uh, Chris Sample. And he said that, uh, and, and the way this thing starts out is you, you get in an elevator and go about four floors down, and then you're walking and coming up, and it's kind of dark, and it, it's just kind of eerie in the way uh, you experience the whole thing. He says uh, as they were going down the elevator, uh, he noticed that all the guys on the elevator with him and with a couple of his buddies were, well, they were kind of older guys. Uh, and then he also noticed that all of them had the same kind of tattoos. And then he realized that, he was on this elevator with a bunch of Holocaust survivors. And he walked through with, with them, and he spent more time watching them and how they viewed things than he actually viewed them themselves. Uh, misunderstanding this, this passage of scripture. Uh, the Jews uh, in Israel today, you cannot stand on a street corner and preach the gospel or hand out a tract. There's ways to evangelize, and we've, we support uh, a couple of guys that are over there doing that. Uh, and it's because uh, Israel has said, once they founded the nation, could you please give us one country, one place on the planet where we will not be called Christ killers? Can you give us one, just one? And that's why you can't do open air evangelism uh, there uh, this, this day. But this, certainly they can still be reached uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. No, we haven't heeded the warning uh, against pride We've actually uh, persecuted them. Now, it's interesting what Jesus says in terms of 
who would take his life in Luke 18, 31. Jesus took the 12 aside and told them, we're going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be justified, will, excuse me, will be fulfilled. He will be handed over to who? Wow, the Gentiles. The Gentiles will mock him, insult him, spit on him. The Gentiles will flog him and kill him. And on the third day, he'll rise again. So much for Christ killers. Now, we know the Sanhedrin was involved, and they, they uh, manipulated the events in order to get uh, Jesus before Pontius Pilate and so forth. Uh, if you think this only happened in Germany, I've got a friend of mine that grew up in Manoa. His father was a very uh, distinguished professor at the University of Hawaii. He was Jewish. And on more than one occasion in Manoa, pretty peaceful little valley there, on more than one occasion in elementary school, he gets beat up because he's Jewish and told that he's a Christ killer. That's not that long ago, and that's not that far away. This is a worldwide thing. It's a huge problem. And, uh, and the church has totally dropped the ball on it. And, uh, and, of course, we know that it was our sins that put Jesus on the cross. And we know that it was the Father that sent the Son to die for our sins. And we know that Jesus was the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world, Paul would tell us. Pride. There's no room for, for pride uh, in our salvation certainly over and against the Jewish people themselves. The second warning is against presumption, and that's in verse 21. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. And again, talking about the bigger picture of, uh, of the Gentiles and the gospel going to them, not to any one individual. David says of this idea of presumption in Psalm 19, 13, keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let uh, them not have dominion over me. We should not presume something that's true when it's not. And we should never presume upon the grace of God. Several things about this. One is we should not presume because of the root, as I've already mentioned. It's the promise to Abraham, Isaac, uh, and Jacob. We should not presume because it's the reason that we are saved. It's the reason that we're saved. God reveals himself, makes those promises. They they didn't always do so great. We've studied Genesis. These guys had their ups and downs. They weren't sinless by any means. But in the end, God remained faithful to them. Those guys came around and held on to the promises of God. And part of that promise was one of their seed, one of their physical descendants, the seed would come. He would be the Messiah to be a blessing to the entire world. Again, and we're saved because of that. And because of a Jewish prophecy to the Jewish people about a new covenant that would come one day in Jeremiah 31. Sometimes we say that uh, in the Old Testament, it was a covenant of law. But in the New Testament, it's a covenant of, and we say grace, don't we? Actually, it's a covenant of blood, according to Jesus. In the Passover, on that Seder night, he took the third cup representing the blood of the lamb, it says, this is the cup of the new covenant. It says it symbolizes his blood being poured out for the forgiveness of sins. The covenant we're under is a covenant of blood. And, uh, and we should be thankful for that and not presume because of the root. Because that cup was a Jewish prophecy to the Jewish people fulfilled by a Jewish Messiah. We shouldn't presume. Secondly, we shouldn't presume uh, because of this particular reason he mentions in verse 19. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief, they were broken off and you stand by faith. But again, they were broken off because of unbelief. We are grafted in, in a sense, to them, again, based on God's election, his choosing us, which is by grace uh, it's so important to remember that. We shouldn't presume. Third, we should not presume that there will always be an opportunity to be saved. Verse 21, for if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. In other words, there's a limited time for people to get saved. And we say that all the time. That's why we say today is the day of salvation. People should never presume that if I don't receive Christ today, there will always be another chance. Uh, there may not be another chance. That's his point here. That's his, and we see that in a lot of places in Scripture. And that's why if you're sharing your faith with someone uh, and you're led by the Lord, just ask them, is there any reason or any, anything that would keep you from receiving Jesus Christ right now? 
And you'll be surprised how many times people, they might have an objection, they might have a reason. And you go, well, I don't even know the answer to that, but I'll get back to you. That's what you do, you just find it out and get back to them. Sometimes they're just gonna say, no, I can't think of any reason. Great, let's pray. Today's the day of salvation. We should never presume there'll always be another opportunity to be saved. Fourth, we should not presume because of God's ability to restore. It's prophetic. Verse 23. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. Again, Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 23, 3, But I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell safely. Uh, now this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that they shall no longer say, as the Lord lives, who brought uh, up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives, who brought up and led the descendants of the house of Israel from the north country and from all the countries where I had driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. Uh, do, uh, is that, ha that hasn't happened. That's all still future. Is God able to restore them again? Paul says, yes, he is. Uh, and he will keep all of these promises to them. Fifth, we should not presume because the restoration will be accomplished. Verse 24, if you were uh, cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into the cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? In other words, as I said before, man, if the Gentiles could get saved, this will be a piece of cake for the Jews. I mean, it's a natural deal for them. Uh, they're raised up in it. They got the right belief system, the covenants, the promises, the special revelation, all to them. It's the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that we're serving, that uh, we worship, that we praise, because he sent the Messiah, Jesus, to die for our sins. It's under a Jewish covenant promised by Jeremiah, under the blood of the Messiah, Jesus, that we're saved. If we can be saved, hey, how much easier, Paul says, Will it be for the Jews to be saved? Of course, we might say to that, then why is it so tough every time I'm trying to share my faith with a Jewish person? It's so tough. I start to share my faith and they just go, but I'm Jewish. Like that ends all the arguments right there. Why is it like that? Paul's going to tell us in the rest of the chapter. That's, that's what we're going to look at next time. That's exactly what he's going to deal with. Why is that so today? Again, the results of the nation rejecting the Messiah, uh, we said there were two. The gospel came to the Gentiles. That's, that's us primarily. Uh, there's a few of us here that aren't, but that's most of us. Uh, and, uh, and it's gone all over the world as a result. And Paul says, in that there should be a provocation to jealousy for Jewish people to come to faith in Christ. And we want that to be said of everyone that it sees us and knows our lives that uh, I wish I had what they had. And I can tell you, if you're, if you're a married couple and uh, you live it out uh, the way God tells you and his design, you'll have what other people don't have and people will be envious uh, of, of you, of your home, of your kids and what you have. As the world gets da darker out there, it takes even a little light to, uh, for people to recognize truth. They'll be rejoicing in the future. Man, Israel's going to get restored. Paul says it's like somebody that's been dead for 2,000 years and he just came back to life. It's going to be like, wow, the world is going to be shocked. And Gentiles should remember their Jewish roots. And we gave you a lot of things to, uh, to think about in, re in regards uh, to that. But it's a shame, isn't it, that, that the church has kind of dropped the ball on this. Paul's pretty clear. Don't get prideful. Don't be presumptuous. Wow, I think we've gone way beyond both of those things. But it's a new day, in a sense. 
You know, we live in a day when prophecy is being fulfilled. We're watching the news in the Middle East every day. I am anyway, constantly. What's going on? What's Putin up to? What's going on in Iran? You know, are we about ready to see the Magog invasion? Are we going to live in that day? Or will the Lord take us? Is the rapture going to happen sooner than that? Will it happen this afternoon or tomorrow morning? We're not sure. We don't know. But it's been said that if you were a Christian, there would be two great times to live on this earth. One would be maybe in the days of Jesus, to actually hear him, see him, hear him teach, hear him sing the Hallel Psalms. That would certainly be exciting. But otherwise, to live in this day, the day that Israel's back in the land. The things that Paul said 2,000 years ago were at the precipice. It's about ready to happen. And it's an exciting time to be alive. But it's a much more exciting time to be a Christian and being alive in this day and age. May God use our lives to provoke the jealousy of all those around us. Amen. I surrender I surrender I surrender
all stand together. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's heart. You lead us by still waters and to mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. Great is your faithfulness. yourself. 